In my office at home, I sit at my desk, I work at home a couple days a week, I do a lot of writing, and right opposite my desk there's a marble bust of Thomas Jefferson, and right above Jefferson is a portrait of John C. Calhoun, and uh, Calhoun has a big smile on his face. And I, I've, I've always looked at this situation over there in the corner with Jefferson is sort of peering out the window and Calhoun is kind of looking down at him smiling. And I think the reason why Calhoun is probably smiling there in, in my office is because he knew that Jefferson said things like this. And I start my paper out with this quote by Jefferson saying, he says, an insurrection once every 20 years is a wholesome feature of national life. And that's the kind of thing I think Calhoun would smirk if he were to meet Jefferson and hear him say that. And these two men, if they were alive today, I'm sure would be donors to the Mises Institute and would probably be on the, uh, the uh, board of directors. But, uh, and, but what I'm going to talk to is uh, going to disappoint those of you from Charleston, if there's anyone from Charleston or South Carolina here, in that Charleston was not the birthplace of the secession movement in the United States. Of all places, it was Salem, Massachusetts, the, the, the heart of the Yankee Empire, so-called. So uh, yes, uh, there were three attempts at secession by the New England Federalists prior to the war between the states uh, between 1800 and 1815. And they occurred around, uh, among the main reasons were the 1803 Louisiana Purchase, the uh, National Embargo of 1807 that Jefferson imposed, and Madison later had an Enforcement Act for that uh, embargo, and the War of 1812. Uh, these men were prominent men. These were among the founding fathers, the New England Federalists. Some of them, uh, most of them fought in the American Revolution, were high-ranking officers in the Revolutionary Army. Some of them signed the uh, Constitution, Declaration of Independence. And if these men had said the things in 1860 and were from the South that they said in, in New England in 1803, they would have been labeled by uh, historians as maniacal fire-eaters and seditionists and would have gone down in, uh, in infamy in, in history. Here are some of the things they said. Um, Timothy Pickering, who was a U.S. Senator, I will rather anticipate a new confederacy exempt from the corrupt and corrupting influence and oppression of the aristocratic Democrats of the South, he said. Uh, there, there will be a separation and the white and black population will mark the boundary. The eastern states must and will dissolve the Union and form a separate government. Uh, that was Senator James Hillhouse. And Aaron Burr added, the northern states must be governed by Virginia or must govern Virginia, and there's no middle ground. And, uh, and so this was the kind of thing that was being said by the New England Federalists, which was the party that was overthrown by the Jefferson's party in, in the year 1800. Their cause was identical to the Southern Confederacy's cause 50 years later, states' rights, self-government, and, uh, and uh, opposing the, uh, the growth and tyranny of the federal government. They condemned the Jefferson administration as being plagued by, quote, falsehood, fraud, and treachery, which caused oppression and barbarity and ruin among the nations, according to uh, Pickering. Uh, they, were, uh, they made arguments identical to John C. Calhoun's arguments uh, several decades later that they thought the South controlled the Congress and the South was using its power in the Congress to oppress the North. And they thought centralized power was uh, very disadvantageous to their region, and therefore they thought secession was the only answer. Uh, interestingly, uh, one of the leaders of this movement was uh, Theodore Dwight, who was John C. Calhoun's uh, academic mentor at Yale. And uh, I don't know for sure, but I suspect Calhoun got some of his ideas from his mentor at Yale, who was among the New England Federalists who, uh, who wanted to secede. And, um, when Jefferson was elected and his party took over not only the presidency but the Congress, it was a disaster for the Federalists because Jefferson was not only an opponent that had defeated the Federalists, but he was hated and despised by them. Uh, here's what uh, one historian says about the attitudes of the New Englanders toward Jefferson. He had been habitually denounced as an antichrist by the political preachers of his time, and in the New England states where the greater part of the ministers were militant Federalists, he was hated with an unholy hate. More false witness had been borne by the ministers of New England and New York against Jefferson than had ever been borne against any other American publicist. Uh, among the other reasons that I've uncovered, uh, among the reasons for this is uh, Jefferson, as, as you all know, was one of the staunchest defenders of separation of church and state, and a lot of these Federalist leaders uh, had in their minds some kind of idea of sort of state-sponsored Puritanism as being a prerequisite for a sound uh, uh, country and they just truly hated Jefferson and all they stood for. Now, some of the ideas, you know, why did they think secession was desirable? 
uh, ethnic homogeneity they thought was necessary for the uh, for a nation to succeed. I'm not endorsing their views. I'm just saying this is what they said. Uh, William Smith Shaw said, the, co the great grand cause of all our present difficulties may be traced to so many hordes of foreigners immigrating to America. And uh, in a widely quoted remark by William Stoughton, he said that God sifted a whole nation that he might send choice grain over into this wilderness. So these, uh, these uh, almost uh, uniformly British immigrants in New England thought that they were God's choice grain and that uh, such things as the uh, Louisiana Purchase, which Jefferson uh, uh, was responsible for, which incorporated hordes of foreigners, from, uh, uh, including the Dutch and the French and Spanish, was an abomination to the New England Federalists. Uh, uh, Josiah Quincy, uh, the town of Quincy, Massachusetts, named after him, warned that uh, the Louisiana Purchase uh, obligated the nation to assimilate, quote, a number of French and Spanish subjects whose habits, manners, and ideas of civil government are wholly foreign to Republican institutions, and the purchase meant that the bonds of this union are virtually dissolved. The states which compose it are, it, it are free from their moral obligation, and that, as it will be the right of all, so it will be the duty of some to prepare definitely for a separation, amicably if, amicably if they can, violently if they must. And uh, now these were Europeans. I mean, these were these were people who were immigrants or the sons of immigrants from Europe. And of course, to this day, we know that the uh, the violence and bloodshed. Uh, Europeans have been murdering each other on a massive scale for centuries. Um, the Bosnia we know about Bosnia today in the news. But these were men who knew that these these uh, cultural differences, the, many of which were incompatible to the Europeans, they feared the same sort of thing would would come would happen over in the in the U.S. That was their opinion. It was at this point in history that the uh, New England Federalists, 1803, uh, began seriously discussing secession. And the ringleader was Timothy Pickering. And, uh, and to make the point that this was not a band of nuts uh, up there in New England that were doing this, Pickering was a colonel of the Essex County, Massachusetts militia at the outset of the American Revolution. He organized the Mass Massachusetts militia. Uh, later served as adjutant general and quartermaster general of the Revolution Army. After the American Revolution, he was a member of Congress, Secretary of War, and U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. Uh, in a letter to George Cabot, Pickery wrote of the depravity of Jefferson's plan of destruction, as he called it, uh, and concluded that, quote, the principles of our revolution, that is the revolution of 1776, point to the remedy, a separation. That this can be accomplished, and without spilling one drop of blood, I have little doubt. The people of the East cannot reconcile their habits, views, and interests with those of the South and West. And so uh, that, was, that was the opinion of the, not only Timothy Pickering, but uh, many of the other New England Federalists. And he undoubtedly had in mind, I think, um, what is written now in a book entitled Albion Seed by uh, David Hackett Fisher, who takes a look at the cultural differences between just the British immigrants to the United States uh, up to the, about this time and uh, makes the case that there is very clear cultural differences that almost made it inevitable that there would be uh, violent clashes between these groups because there always had been violent clashes between these cultural groups back in England. And these were just the English immigrants. This didn't count the Dutch and the French and, and others uh, immigrants. The Federalists were aware of this and they were stridently opposed to multicultural assimilation because of this, but they were not opposed to commerce between these groups. They wanted a, a Switzerland uh, or a Swiss style uh, government, uh, highly decentralized federalist system uh, that has worked well for well over 150 years in that country. And the type of system they wanted was they wanted the New England states to be one confederacy, the southern states another confederacy. They talked about a western confederacy also, but they thought that the best thing uh, to do would be to have a, a federalist system set up like this and have them uh, avoid the cultural conflicts but thrive through free trade among these different uh, sections. Uh, what one historian uh, concluded was secession would, quote, render a friendly and commercial intercourse between the North and the South, for the Southern states would probably want to contract out for such things as naval protection by the Northern Confederacy, while the products of the South would be important to the navigation and commerce to the north. That was uh, the historian Henry, Henry Adams who, uh, who said that. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the episode regarding Aaron Burr, 
This was uh, actually an attempt at secession, the Aaron Burr-Alexander Hamilton duel. Uh, the Federalists cut a deal with Aaron Burr in 1804. They pledged the support of the Federalist Party and its money to get Burr elected uh, governor of New York. All the other New England states at the time were on the verge of seceding, but they needed New York. It was a big state, a wealthy state, and the deal was, we will help get you elected governor if, in turn, you have uh, New York State secede, because if New York secedes, all the other New England states will follow. And, of course, Burr lost the election by seven votes, and Alexander Ham Hamilton had denounced him as profligate, lacking in integrity, dangerous, intemperate, and dictatorial, and he challenged him to a duel, and he killed Alexander Hamilton. And because Burr had been associated with the New England Federalists, that sort of put the damper on their movement for a while, because... Uh, Hamilton was widely revered by a lot of Americans, and, uh, and uh, it was a big scandal. All throughout this time, up to this point, 1800 to 1804, no one had questioned uh, the right of any state to secede. Uh, the only arguments that were ever made were uh, utilitarian arguments. The time is not right. You may be overestimating the economic benefits of secession, things like this. But no one questioned the inherent constitutional right. Jefferson himself in his first inaugural address said this, if there be any among us who wish to dissolve the Union or to change its Republican form, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. Uh, of course, the author of the Declaration of Independence could hardly uh, say anything else. Uh, Jefferson, was, as, as was mentioned last night, was uh, Historians think he's probably uh, the co-author with Madison of the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, which said, quote, where the powers were assumed by the national government, which had not been granted by the states, nullification is the rightful remedy. And also that every state has an original and natural right to nullify of its own authority all assumptions of power by others within its limits. So both political parties at this time believed in the inherent constitutional right of secession as, as, a, as an important ingredient, if not a central ingredient, ingredient to a free country. Uh, there's a section of my paper here that I call Calhounism, because the New England Federalists of the early 1800s out Calhoun Calhoun. They made the same arguments he did, which is not too surprising, because as I said, his teacher, Theodore Dwight, uh, was part of this movement, his teacher at Yale, his mentor. And uh, at the time, uh, Calhoun was only about 20 years old and a student at Yale, but uh, throughout the published letters of the New England Federalists, what they were complaining about was the, art, was the same thing that Calhoun is most known for, that the centralized power of the federal government was unfairly, unjustly uh, uh, affecting the South. If you transpose the words North and South, the New England Federalists were making the same arguments uh, exactly. Um, for example, they were arguing that the government, quote, had fallen into the hands of infidel, anti-commercial, anti-New England Southerners. They believed there was a conspiracy among the, quote, Virginia faction. <laughs> the Virginia faction wanted to, quote, govern and depress New England, according to Stephen Higginson. Uh, John Lowell Jr. said that uh, in any conflict between their state and the federal government, listen to this, he said, it is our duty, our most solemn duty, to vindicate the rights and support the interests of the state we represent. Pickering added, uh, along with this, that in a letter exchange, there is a natural order to me towards Salem, Massachusetts first, then New England, and then the Union at large. And this struck me as virtually identical to what many of the Southern Confederates said in 1860, and it, it especially reminded me of the episode of where General Winfield Scott offered Robert E. Lee command of the Union Army just a few days before the Virginia seceded. And Lee's response was, was no, of course, uh, no. He say, Lee said, I shall return to my native state and share the miseries of my people and save in defense will draw my sword on none. And it's virtually identical to what uh, the New England Federalists were saying uh, 50 years earlier. Roger Griswold, the governor of Connecticut, sounded exactly like John C. Calhoun. Uh, if you were to transpose the words north and south. He said, the balance of power under the present government is decidedly in favor of the southern states. The extent and increasing population of those states must forever secure to them the preponderance which they not, uh, now possess. He said the New Englanders were paying the principal part of the expenses of government without receiving commensurate benefits. Uh, and he concluded from that that there can be no safety to the northern states without a separation from the Confederacy. And it was in italics. His italics was the last part, without a separation from the Confederacy. That is virtually identical to uh, Calhoun's arguments uh, 
you know, several decades later. Uh, when uh, Jefferson in 1807 declared an embargo, a national embargo, put an end to legal international trade, uh, and then uh, his successor, James Madison, in 1809, imposed, imposed an enforcement act, which was sort of a war on drugs style program where the army could, uh, uh, could board any sh merchant ship on the mere suspicion that they intended to trade uh, internationally with the goods on it, and they could seize and take the goods on the ship. This really radicalized the New England secession, uh, secessionists, and they issued a public, <coughs> public proclamation, which is sort of a spit-in-your-face proclamation to the federal government, really. They, they said, uh, uh, and reminding the country that, quote, the U.S. Constitution is a treaty of alliance and confederation, they said, and that the central government was an association of states and whenever its provisions are violated or its original principles departed from by a majority of the states or their people is no longer an effective instrument, but that any state is at liberty by the spirit of that contract to withdraw itself from the Union. Uh, the Massachusetts leg legislature uh, declared, passed a law declaring the Enforcement Act not binding legally, so they nullified it. This was, uh, this was a nullification just like the... Uh, the, uh, the famous uh, South Carolina legislature's nullification of the Tariff of Abominations in, in 1832. The attitude towards slavery uh, was another issue regarding uh, why the New Englanders wanted to secede. They were upset with the three-fifths clause of the Constitution uh, that existed at that time that allowed that five slaves could be counted as three whites. They didn't want to. They didn't want to count black people as a, as equivalents of white people. They wanted black people to count as zero rather than three-fifths. That was their, their problem uh, th that they had. They were not abolitionists. Uh, according to Quincy, the slave representation is the cause of all the difficulties we labor under. Because of this arrangement, the southern states have an influence in our national councils altogether disproportionate to their wealth, strength, and resources. They never uh, uh, raised any moral objection to slavery. It was just that uh, they were getting outvoted in the Congress, and they didn't like that. And this shouldn't be too surprising because of their views on ethnic homogeneity, especially in the the primacy of English immigrants. Uh, they did abolish slavery in Massachusetts in the 1780s, but according to one historian, uh, the response of the, of the New England Federalists was to, they quote, tightened their poor laws, warned more Negroes away from their boundaries, and established segregated schools and churches, and uh, a lot of them warned uh, 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 black people to, in the words of uh, the Federalist cleric Jedediah Morris, quote, be contented in the humble station in which providence has placed you. That is, don't try to become educated and successful. Stay where you are. Uh, that was in, in the North. Historian James Banner uh, concludes that, uh, uh, you know, has studied this and has said that, quote, freed it appeared the Negro was more of a political threat than enslaved. What the Federalists wanted and what their assaults upon the three-fifths clause were designed to gain was not the abolition of slavery, but the abolition of Negro representation. And uh, now when the War of 1812 came along, uh, all of the New England states voted against going to war. They all voted with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they all voted um, with John Randolph, who was from Virginia, who was a fierce opponent of the War of 1812, and they voted against uh, John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was, uh, was for the War of 1812. All the New England states, along with New York, Jer New Jersey, and Delaware, were against it. And the reason, among the reasons why, they said, uh, According to Governor George Morris of New York, if we do this, we are to be taxed beyond our means and subjected to military conscription. We cannot exist but in poverty and contempt without foreign commerce, Pickering uh, answered. And he said, by a war of any continuance with Great Britain, that commerce will be annihilated. The Massachusetts legislature declared the, legislature declared the war uh, needless and unwise, and they instructed their people. They said, quote, let there be no volunteers except for defensive war. And uh, whenever the uh, U.S. government came to conscript uh, young men from New, in from New England, uh, the Federalists would declare these young men as debtors and are therefore, uh, <clears throat> and therefore um, excuse me, <clears throat> the property of their creditors. And the Federalist courts would rule that they therefore could not leave the state because they were the property of their creditors. And so they effectively uh, seceded from the War of 1812 by not cooperating with military conscription. And... Uh, the U.S. Treasury was literally bankrupted by the War of 1812 very quickly, and so uh, James Madison responded uh, by doubling tariffs on all goods, uh, 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 virtually destroying any kind of international trade that was taking place. And they didn't raise much money because there was no international trade to speak of, so it really didn't matter. Uh, 
But this policy of protectionist extremism that was being followed, which at this time the North, the New England states, thought they were being disproportionately harmed by. 20 or 30 years later, it was the South that whose uh, cotton exports accounted for about 80% of all exports from the United States. Things changed dramatically in the next 20 or 30 years. But uh, what happened was, with the cutting off of international commerce, uh, there were a lot of domestic industries that started being subsidized and propped up by the federal government to, uh, to produce the goods that had been purchased previously from England and, and elsewhere. And the economist Frank Kelsey said that, quote, the men who brought about the war felt in a measure responsible for its results. And uh, what he means by that is that for the next several decades, the men who supported the War of 1812 thought that we're responsible for its results and its response were these protected industries. And so we need to continue protecting them. They, in other words, they spawned an entire uh, collection of protectionist... Is that a machine gun? What is that? <laughs> I thought there was a bug up there. That's not very nice, is it? Yeah, okay. That's better. I'll just yell. I can yell. Anyways, uh, they created these protectionist uh, industries, and, uh, and arguably this led to the tariff of abominations because they created a whole clack of special interest groups who lobbied for protectionism and higher tariffs. It led to the nullification crisis and you could argue that it also contributed to the war between the states because protectionism was a primary cause. One of the biggest complaints of the South was uh, interference in, in free trade by the, uh, by the central government. There was a convention, the Hartford Convention. They finally, the uh, New England public was fed up. The War of 1812 was the last straw. There was, there was even starting to get violence over this and demanding something be done and the, uh, the uh, Federalist Fathers convened a convention in Hartford. The bottom line of behind the Hartford Convention is that they got together and they did not secede through this convention, but they issued a number of proclamations regarding eliminating the Three-Fifths Clause and so forth. And uh, the reason why they did not go through with this at this time in seceding was summarized by uh, John Lowell, uh, of Massachusetts, and his explanation was that, quote, separation would have severed these, these men's, their last chance for preferment at the national level. These were men who had high hopes someday that they would gain power again in Washington, and, uh, they, and so uh, even though they talked for years about seceding, apparently the, the, uh, the group that dominated the Hartford Convention uh, ended up uh, making, it, making nothing of it. So they effectively seceded during the War of 1812, and uh, they laid the groundwork for arguments for secession. And all throughout these, these episodes, from 1800 to 1814, uh, as historian Edward Payson Powell has written, quote, the right of a state to withdraw from the Union was not disputed. Uh, this was a national debate over this. This was not a secret argument among the Federalists, and no one argued over the inherent right of a state to, uh, or states to secede at this time, because after all, the Declaration of Independence talks about this as one of the uh, inviolable rights of the American people. And uh, an interesting thing, uh, the next, the final part of my paper, I talk about what I call the secessionist legacy of the New England Federalists. Because these ideas about the Declaration of Independence and the inherent right of secession as a, uh, as a right of the American people did not die in the North. In fact, I think they were, they were revitalized in the North and clarified in the North because of all the actions of the New England uh, Federalists. There is a very fat book entitled Northern Editorials on Secession by the historian Howard Perkins. And he gathered up all the editorials that must have been written around 1860 and 1861 in Northern newspapers. Uh, so if you want an idea of what public opinion in the North was on the eve of the war between the states, you should take a look through northern editorials on secession. I, I would bet a lot of money that the library here at this, at this school has this in their, in their library, and most libraries do, I, I, major universities anyway. And it's fascinating to me to read through what some of the editorial writers were saying because uh, uh, Howard Perkins says that the big majority of editorial writers in the North were all in favor of allowing the South to secede. Public opinion was all in favor of that. The minority 
was in favor of, of opposing the Southerners uh, in, in 1860. And I'd like to read to you some of the uh, things uh, that the northern newspapers were saying. November 10, 1860, a little more than a month before South Carolina seceded, the New York Atlas and Argus editorialized that, quote, we sympathize and justify the South because their rights have been invaded to the extreme limit possible within the forms of the Constitution. The Chicago Daily Times and Herald, 11 days later, said, like it or not, the cotton states will secede. The government will not then go to pieces, but Southerners will be allowed to regain their sense of independence and honor. Uh, on November 24, 1860, the New Hampshire Democrat Standard complained about the, quote, fanatics and demagogues of the North. That should bring an applause, right? In this crowd, <laughs> who, had, who had waged war on the institutions of the South and appealed for concession of the just rights of our Southern brethren. The New York Journal of Commerce, which is a very influential paper, condemned what they call the, quote, meddlesome spirit of the people of the North who have a tendency to seek and regulate and control people in other communities. It reminds me of the anti-smoking Nazis in my state right now that just passed a smoking ban. But on November 13, 1860, the Bangor, Maine Daily Union defended the Southern secessionists by, by explaining that a union, quote, depends for its continuance on the free consent and will of the sovereign people of each state, and when that consent and will is withdrawn on either part, their union is gone. If military force is used, then a state can only be held as a subject province and can never be a co-equal member of the American Union. The Davenport, Iowa Democrat and News argued against secession, against secession on the following grounds. It says, we are apparently in the minority in the North, but uh, where many of the leading and most influential papers of the Union say that any state of the Union has a right to secede. So there were papers that were saying, well, we're in a tiny minority here because we're against secession in the South. Uh, the Cincinnati Daily Press said, uh, we believe that the right of any member of this Confederacy to dissolve its political relations with others and assume an independent position is absolute. But in other words, if South Carolina wants to go out of the Union, she has the right to do so, and no party or power may justly say her nay. Uh, they surmise that this, after all, is what the Declaration of Independence means when it says that whenever government becomes destructive of the protection of lives, liberties, and the pursuit of happiness, then, quote, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish their government and to institute a new government. New York Daily Tribune, which was very influential at this time, added that if any tyranny and despotism justified the American Revolution of, 19, of 1776, then, quote, we do not see why it would not justify the secession of five millions of Southerns from the Federal Union in 1861. Uh, once South Carolina seceded in, uh, in 1860, uh, dozens of Northern editorialists uh, just viewed it as a confirmation of the principle of self-sovereignty and self-government. Uh, because Yuri Maltsev is here, I have an article from the Kenosha, Wisconsin Democrat. Yuri lives in, uh, in Kenosha. In, in January 11, 1861, your, your paper said that secession was the very germ of liberty and declared that the right of secession adheres to the people of every sovereign state. Uh, the New York Journal of Commerce, uh, the same day, warned that by opposing secession, Northerners will be changing the nature of government from a voluntary one in which the people are sovereigns to a despotism where one part of the people are slaves. Such is the logical deduction from the policy of the advocates of force. And... Uh, and one that will be a favorite in this crowd, uh, the New York Tribune on February 5th, 1861, said uh, Lincoln's latest speech uh, is characterized by the arguments of the tyrant, force, compulsion, and power, was uh, what they said. Uh, the Daily Tribune also said that the great principle, to, uh, principle embodied in, by Jefferson in the Declaration is that governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed. Therefore, if the southern states want to secede, they have a clear right to do so. And the New York Times on March 21st said, there is a growing sentiment throughout the North in favor of letting the Gulf states go. And so what all this tells me is that if you survey public opinion in the North, it was uh, Abe Lincoln and a small handful of uh, people who wanted to go to war to force the South uh, to, com to uh, not secede from the Union. And uh, if, you, if public opinion means anything to you, and, and if these men reflected all public opinion in the North, and uh, I consider this, I call this the secessionist legacy of the New England Federalists because from the time of the Declaration of Independence, it was understood, as uh, Professor Wilson said last night, that, that secession was, an, was a, a, a very important feature of a free nation.
And we understood this until the war between the states, but we for have forgotten it since then. And uh, my time is about up, and I think I covered almost uh, everything I wanted to say. Thank you for your patience, and uh, have a nice day.